This is going to be a walkthrough of the brand new scroll trigger plugin for GSAP, which I'm very excited to share. But before we get into the details, here's just a taste of what it can do. So in this first example, you'll see that as we scroll down, we get to this section that gets pinned. While I continue to scroll, it's revealing the image. If I scroll backwards, you'll see that it goes the other way. And then once I reach the end, then it becomes unpinned and we continue down the page. So pinning is included in scroll trigger. And then we also have this slide in panels example, where as I scroll down, you can see that it gets pinned and then another second comes in from the left, another one from the right, and then finally from the top. We also have this one where uh, scroll trigger tracks the velocity of scrolling. And we've linked that to the skew of these images. So the faster I scroll, the more they get skewed. We can also pair this with CSS scroll snapping. So as I release scroll, it kind of snaps to these sections. Now here's a parallax example, where as I scroll down, you can see that the uh, background image seems to scroll at a different rate. Here's an example that as I scroll, you know, scrolling is linked to this uh, path. Now this is a relatively advanced example where as I scroll down, it's actually causing things to appear to scroll horizontally. And that's actually just an animation. And also we've got snapping applied. So as I release, it's always landing at one of these sections, which again is inside of a timeline. It's just an animation. And then lastly, this is a pretty advanced example. Um, from Motion Harvest on CodePen. And as I scroll, we're kind of going through this tube. Now let's get into the details. And we'll start with a common problem that Scroll Trigger solves. Here I've got three boxes, A, B, and C. And I have a tween setup that animates box A uh, along the x-axis and it rotates it. So we can see that that animation works great. But what happens if I change this to animate box C and I refresh and then if I wait for a second or two and then I scroll down uh oh the animation already finished we didn't get to see that lovely animation we can solve that by simply activating the plugin and then all we have to do is add a scroll trigger and if I run this and then I wait a second or two and I scroll down oh we get to see the animation this time yay but if I scroll back down and up again, you know, it's, it stayed where it was, of course. What if I want that to replay every time it enters the viewport again? Or maybe I want it to pause when it gets, you know, when it leaves the viewport at the top. How would I do that? Well, let's talk about toggle actions. Now, since we're going to configure this scroll trigger, we will make it into an object. And in that object, we will make the trigger the same thing that we had before. And then when a scroll trigger activates or deactivates, it can tell the animation to do something. So by default, toggle actions look like this. So we have these different positions. There's four different positions. And it's a string with a keyword in each spot. And I'll talk about each of these positions in a moment. The keywords can be any of the following. Play, pause, resume, reverse, restart, reset, complete, or none. In this case, it is just playing when it enters the screen maybe we want it to restart each time it enters the viewport. So if I refresh, we'll see that, okay, it, it plays just like before, but if I go back down and, and out of view again, and then I bring it back in, it restarts. Now the next position is for when it goes forward past the end point. Let's try making that pause. So we'll rerun this, and we'll notice that if we scroll really fast, now it, it left out the top of the uh, viewport, and then we come back in, Notice that it's paused. Now, we probably would want it to do something else when it comes back in. Of course, when it entered from the bottom, again, that was the restart toggle action referred to here. And so if we want it to resume when it comes back in, that's this next position. So we'll change none to resume. And if we rerun this, we'll see that indeed it restarts then. It should pause it here. And then when we come back on screen, it resumes it. Perfect just as we would expect. We could even reverse it here. Run that, go off the top, and then when we come back in, it goes backwards. And the final position is for when we scroll all the way back past the start. Usually pause or reset is good here. So if we do something like this, it not only ensures that viewers actually see the animation, 
but it improves the performance by not animating things that are off screen. But what if we want to link the scroll bar to the animation so that it acts like a scrubber? We'll get to that later. But first, let's talk about positioning our scroll triggers with start and end properties. And by default, the scroll trigger starts as soon as the trigger element, which is box C in this case, enters the viewport at the very bottom. But we can tell it to start instead when the top of that trigger element hits the center of the scroller, which is the viewport. So if we run this, we'll see that when we scroll down, it doesn't start when it enters the viewport. It actually waits until it hits the center before beginning. So again, this first value relates to the trigger element, and the second value in the string relates to the scroller itself, which is the viewport in this case. Now to visualize this better, we're gonna add markers. So we just say markers true, and when we run, we get these fancy markers that give us a visual indicator of when things should start. So when these two green lines uh, line up and you know this one passes the other one, that's when it starts. Now you can use keywords like top, center, or bottom, but you can also use pixel values or percentages which are always relative to the top. So for example, if we say 20 pixels from the top of the trigger element, uh, when that hits 80% down in the viewport, that's when we want to uh, make this scroll trigger start. So if we run this and scroll up, we'll see that indeed it works as expected. The trigger start here is 20 pixels down from the top of that, and the scroller start is 80% down in the viewport. Now we can also define an end, which by default is when the bottom of the trigger element hits the top of the viewport, but maybe we should make this into 100 pixels. And we run, and we see that indeed the scroller end is 100 pixels down from the top, and the trigger position is at the very bottom of that as well. Now for the end value, we can also make it relative to the start. So for example, if we want it to be 300 pixels from wherever the start happens to be, and this is a very common thing to want to do, just use the relative prefix there, plus equals, and then 300. We can have px on there or not, it doesn't really matter. And if we run this, we'll see that indeed it is precisely 300 pixels further down from where the start is. In fact, you can even use a function for dynamic values and it'll get called whenever the screen is resized as well. So for example, if we want the distance between the start and the end to match the width of the element that has some fancy responsive CSS applied, we could do something like this. So it's just a function that's returning a relative value that is the, the offset width of the C elements. So it's 100 pixels and Let's make this center center, just to make it a little more visible here. Run this, and indeed as we scroll down, we'll see that it is indeed 100 pixels down from the other. And you're welcome to use a function value for start as well. And by the way, you can use a completely different element for the end trigger. So in this case, they're both relating to the trigger, but perhaps we want to say the end trigger should be C and the starting one should be A and we're going to animate element B. So when the top of the A element hits 50 pixels down from the top into the viewport and the bottom of element C hits 80% down from the top of the viewport, it should end. So we'll run this and check this out. When the green starting lines cross, it begins. When the red end lines cross, it ends. So you get ultimate flexibility in defining where your scroll triggers start and where they end. Now up to this point, scroll trigger has just been toggling the playback state of the animation. So when we pass the start, it begins the animation. Even if I go forward or backward in between, it just continues to play. However, watch what happens if I add scrub true to the scroll trigger and rerun this. Now you'll see that when we pass the start, anywhere in between there, it's actually locking the animation playhead to the scroll bar so that no matter which way we go, it's always in lockstep with it. But you can smooth that out if you want. You can actually make this to a number, which is a time in seconds that it should take the playhead to catch up. So if we put one here, it's gonna take one second to catch up and we'll run this and you'll notice that there's a ghosted uh, you know, gray C back there, which let's tap into that so that we can see the comparison. If I just copy this whole thing, paste it down here and we'll be animating the ghost and everything else is the same except the scrub. We'll just set it back to true so that we can see the comparison between the two. So now as we scroll past, we'll see that it takes the orange one a little time to catch up. 
In fact, it takes a second for it to catch up exactly. And we can exaggerate a little bit more, set it to three, and you'll notice that it is indeed taking longer to catch up. It's a very smooth effect. And note that this is not scroll jacking. It is merely affecting the playhead of the animation. The native scroll bar is, you know, the, the whole page, the rest of the page is animating exactly in lockstep with the scroll bar. It's just the animation that is lagging intentionally to smooth things out. And this isn't just for simple tweens. Here, let's get rid of the ghost and we can use this scroll trigger in a timeline. So I'll copy this out of here and we'll create a timeline inside the bars for that. We'll put the scroll trigger and then we'll add these uh, tweens to that timeline and we'll add a few more. And now if we run this, you'll see that the entire animation is scrubbing back and forth the whole timeline. Pinning can take your scroll based animations to a whole new level. Now, before we pin anything, let's just, again, look at how this works. We've got scrub enabled. And so as we scroll up the page, you know, C is, the orange C is moving up on the screen as well, because of course we're scrolling up. But if we say pin true and then run, now when we scroll up past this, the starting point, it becomes pinned in place while that trigger is active. Now you could pin any element here. It doesn't, you don't have to say true. If you set true, it assumes the trigger is what you're talking about that you want to pin, but we could say like ghost for that other element in the back, the gray C. So now as we scroll up, C is pinned in place. I'm sorry, the ghost is pinned in place. Or you can pass in a regular DOM element. Now pinning is even more useful when you're dealing with sections or panels in your site. So here is an example. Let me run this. We have some things commented out here. Don't worry about the code yet, but we have this, this timeline animating the uh, X percent and Y percent of a few different elements, which we can't really see right now. But again, if we run it here, then if we scroll down really fast, that animation is playing down here. These are all absolutely positioned inside of a container element. And so without scroll trigger, those are just kind of running right away. But if we enable the scroll trigger, and you'll notice that this is a kind of a different syntax. We haven't seen this before. We could easily embed this inside of the timeline, but I just wanted to show you that you can use scroll trigger and create a scroll trigger independently, and then you can pass in an animation, you know, a timeline, a tween, whatever, in this fashion. Um, and we'll go in more into this syntax later on when we talk about customizing. But for now, we'll just note that the trigger is the container, and then we are pinning it and scrubbing it. And so now when I run this, the animation is not playing. And then we scroll down and now we get to the container element and it pins it. So now when I keep scrolling down, well, if I scroll back up, you'll see that, you know, this is in lock step with my uh, scrolling. And so this is what creates that effect. We're just scrubbing that animation back and forth here. Now by default, scroll trigger adds padding to the bottom of the pinned elements. So here I've got uh, no pinning enabled. This is just to show you how things are laid out. We've got some panels that are all the full height except for this orange one, okay? Now, if I enable the pinning on this scroll trigger here, let's just see what happens. So now when I scroll down, we'll see that there's this gap in between and when it becomes unpinned, everything is caught up. So since we're pinning it for exactly 300 pixels, that's how much padding was added under here. So again, that makes it so that when things catch up, you know, there's no overlapping. So if we disable this, which we can do by saying pin spacing false, and then we run this. Now, when we scroll down, we'll see that there's no spacing, but now when it becomes pinned, things are overlapping for the duration of that pin, which can actually be beneficial. You can use that to your advantage, like in this demo, where again, we've just got a bunch of panels laid out like this. And then now when I enable this and I run it, all we're doing is looping through each panel and creating a scroll trigger for it that pins things and disables pin spacing. So now when I scroll up, we get this really cool layered effect with the panels coming in on top of each other. 
Now, speaking of panels, let me show you two other techniques that are really useful. So here I've commented out all the code, but we have this, this layout where there are several panels that are kind of side by side. So I'm scrolling here left to right. And what if we want to wire this up so that the user could scroll vertically to have this appear to scroll horizontally? So all we got to do is disable the, the overflow X so that now users cannot scroll that way anymore. So now they can't get to the other panels. But now if we uncomment this code, we'll see that we're just, we have a, a simple tween of all the sections. We're grabbing them, we're making them into an array here. And the main reason for that is so that we can get the length, um, meaning we could add as many panels as we want later on, and it'll all, this will all work. But we're just animating the X percent of all those, you know, based on the number of, of panels that we have in there. And then we're setting up the scroll trigger so that it's going to pin the, uh, the container. And when we run this, you'll see that sure enough, now we have this vertical scroll bar. And that's again, because by default, scroll trigger will add the padding to the bottom of the, um, the element that's pinned. And so we get this nice long scroll bar. And you'll also notice that there's this snap uh, value here. And it's just one divided by, you know, the number of sections or the panels minus one. So this is always going to be a progress value. Uh, actually, there's a whole bunch of different things you could do here. And I won't get into all of them. Check out the docs. You can have it snap to labels in the timeline. You can use your own logic, you a custom function, whatever. But in this case, we're just uh, basing it on the, the number of, of panels or sections that we have. And so you'll notice that if I scroll right to, you know, where it's sort of in the middle of two sections and I release, it automatically goes and, and kind of lands on the closest uh, section. And if I, you know, use my mouse wheel, same kind of thing, it won't let the users just get stuck in between two different panels. It applies this snapping. And we have the smoothing applied here because we set scrub to one. So it's taking a second to kind of catch up. So it's this really nice buttery smooth effect for panels, you know, very advanced kind of features with relatively small amount of code. And you also notice that the end value is a function and it is returning the width of the uh, container element. So that just makes it feel more natural because, you know, if you're on a mobile device with a small screen, it'll act differently than if you're on a, you know, a big desktop monitor. So this function gets called every time the screen is resized. And so this is all dynamic. This is all, you know, if you have uh, media queries and, and things are resizing and such, it'll all just work. A scroll trigger is not just for animations. The syntax I've been showing you is the most concise for animations, but you can create scroll triggers independently and then just use the callbacks to do just about anything you want. So I can take this animation and use exactly the same object and just wrap it like so. And now this in and of itself won't do anything, but let us add a, an on enter callback. And we'll also add an on leave. And if we run this, we'll see that as we scroll down, then as soon as we cross the uh, start there, it says we entered in the console and then we leave. But if we go backwards, you'll notice there are no callbacks until we go forward again. And that's because those are different callbacks. One is on enter back when you go backwards into the viewport and then there's on leave back. So now if we run and clear this, we'll see that we enter, we leave, and then we enter back and we're all the way back. Now there's also an on update, which runs every single time the scroll trigger is updated. And we actually get a parameter past each one of these, which is the scroll trigger instance itself. And that has various properties like progress, which is a number between zero and one, indicating the uh, progress from the start to the end. Uh, instead of a crazy long number, we'll just say two fixed. So three decimal places. So now if I run this and I clear out the console, we should see that as it goes, we get the values between zero and one for progress. There's also an on toggle and we can check to see if it's is active. And on toggle runs every time it changes between inactive and active or the other way around. Now, another really useful feature is being able to toggle a class. So if we say toggle class and we'll just say active. So in the CSS, I do have an active 
class that will set the box to blue when it is active. And sure enough, whenever that element is in between the start and end, it gets that class added to it. And you can add that class to multiple elements, not just the trigger if you want. You have total control, just see the docs for that. Now you can also add an ID, which is an arbitrary string. So we can just say my ID. And then when we run this, we'll notice that that ID gets added to the markers everywhere. So when you have multiple scroll triggers, this is really useful to be able to see which markers go with which thing. And it also lets you reference that instance and grab it by the scroll trigger dot get by ID method. Now another very useful feature is the ability to set defaults. So if we have a lot of scroll triggers on the page and we want to have them all use the same kind of toggle actions by default, we could do this. And we could also say markers true. So we have this one spot that we can kind of enable markers across the board. And then when we're ready to push our site out live, we can remove that one line and we're ready to go. Because of course you wouldn't want markers in your live site. Now by default, the scroller is the viewport, but you can define a custom one. So you can say, let's say you have a div uh, with an ID of container. This will make the scroll trigger watch, you know, the scroll position of that element instead of the viewports. And finally, by default, it looks for vertical scrolling, but if you'd like to switch it to horizontal, you can just say horizontal true, and it'll watch for horizontal instead of vertical. I think you're gonna love all the possibilities that scroll trigger opens up for you. And it's tight integration with GSAP, should make it easy to get up and running fast. As always, if you have any questions, head over to the Greensock forums. Get Scroll Trigger today at greensock.com. Happy tweening.